Kathleen join in welcoming Dr. Fancy. Low progesterone levels. 
And this may appear after her pregnancy or two. Maybe baby one, she gets her bigger back. Baby two, she works a little harder with baby three. Baby four, where did this come from? I've never had this before. Or I see some pre-pregnancy patients that uh, this is where they carry the fat distribution. And when I do the testing on them, I see an imbalance as it relates to the estrogen and the progesterone. Next slide. Android obesity is another pattern we see. I had a patient come in not too long ago. She said, I've always been able to stuff in my shirts and wear belts. I can't do that anymore. My waistline is gone. It's disappeared. What's happening to me? With the android obesity, we see the weight distribution in that mid-body area. And this is very concerning as it relates to disease risk because this type of phenotype is associated with an increased risk of metabolic syndrome, of diabetes, of hypertension, of lipid abnormalities, as well as cardiovascular disease. Now, the American Heart Association has guidelines for us, oh, we can just go backwards, as it relates to that waist circumference. And this is a, st a test that you can do at home that you take measure out of your soda kit. And um, if that waist circumference measures 35 inches or more, you are at an increased risk. And the place you measure is uh, you find the bottom of the ribs and you find the top of the hip bone and you mark the place in between the two. And, and it's hard to measure yourself. You really need a friend or a nurse or a pharmacist or someone to help you do this to get an accurate measurement. Uh, we see this is an increased pattern in women after menopause. And when we test patients, oftentimes this is what I see on the hormone profiles. High testosterone and high DHEA, these are both androgen types of hormones, and normal or low estrogen and low progesterone. Also, there can be a, a phenotype of non obese hyperandrogenism where that waist to hip ratio is elevated. We, we see also the hormone imbalance on testing, and this is associated with polycystic ovarian syndrome, with eating disorders with mood disorders such as depression, aggression, and also with the female acne triad. So hormone imbalance can occur in women in their teens and in their 20s, and this is a, a pattern that I'll often see. Now what about worries in women? Uh, what a woman is eating and what she's drinking certainly affects her health, but also what she's feeling and what she's thinking have an impact. And we have several, several large-scale studies, uh, the ADMA study and the POWER study, demonstrating that in women with situations of feeling depressed or low mood or blue mood or feeling an anxious mood or panicky mood, they have changes in thrombotic and inflammatory factors that increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. They have abnormal responses to stress as it relates to the stress hormone cortisol. And women that have experienced childhood abuse or childhood trauma have changes in the pathways having to do with the stress response in the brain and the adrenal glands that revisit them at midlife. And finally, women with an attitude of hostility will have uh, problems with their blood vessels, uh, leading to a condition called endothelial dysfunction, which uh, uh, increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, when I say a hostile woman, you might have an image in your mind of what that looks like. But in the psychology literature, when we measure hostility, we do it in a, in a very specific way as it relates to attitudes of women. And these are women who perceive the actions of others to be exploitative or manipulative. They also have difficulty with establishing relationships of trust and intimacy. And most of the time, their looming consciousness, that chatter inside their head, is negative. They're feeling guilty, they're feeling resentful, they have low self-esteem, they may have unexpressed anger, but that is what is turning around. And that type of psychological situation does increase the risk of cardiovascular uh, disease. And women with chronic unresolved psychological stress can also uh, have this similar situation Physiologically, these would be women that are caregivers for dementia patients, women that have special needs children, where they have this ongoing, high emotional, psychological demand. Uh, those women are more prone to rapid aging as well as 
changes in the immune system. So the sex steroids and the steroid hormones affect a lot in women's health. It's not just about their ability to reproduce, their ability to carry a pregnancy to term or to breastfeed. Uh, it certainly impacts body composition, their sexual satisfaction, their mood, uh, the quality of sleep, bone density, musculoskeletal pain, their sense of vitality and stamina. These are some conditions that are impacted by sex steroid levels in female patients. This is not an exhaustive list, but if I have a patient that has any of these conditions, I want to know what's going on with her hormones. Because if there's an underlying hormone imbalance that has not been addressed, and I address it, this may lead to decreased exacerbations of a chronic condition, or I might be able to minimize uh, the types of drug therapies that I have to use just the use of hormone supplementation. Next. These are other conditions. You can see skin disorders, pain syndromes, uh, connective tissue diseases, even asthma has connections to hormone imbalance. So as we look at weight issues in women and aging, uh, some women feel that exercise might be the best approach to take. Well, from my practical experience, I can tell you I've not had great success with this as as the primary focus. Why is that? She joins a gym, she starts a program, she starts a boot camp, and then what happens? Mom gets sick. She has to drop everything, go take care of dad, take care of everything at home. Uh, or a child gets sick, or the husband loses his job and have to transfer. And there's issues surrounding that. Um, the, uh, there's certainly an expense and uh, a time investment. And again, with the standard cardiovascular interventions, I think that they emphasize cardiovascular factors, but may miss out on the psychological, neurological, and endocrine factors. And that affects how a woman is eating and how she's feeling. Uh, when we look at diet interventions, uh, whatever diet you want to pick, uh, when we look at good quality scientific studies of particular diets, we tend to see, on average, a weight loss of about 10 pounds in the first one to three months. If anybody in here has ever been on a diet, probably had this happen to you. Um, and then a rebound or a relapse occurs. And a sustained weight loss of greater than 10 to 15 pounds has not been achieved for greater than 12 months in any large patient populations. And this is comparing some popular diets such as Weight Watchers, The Zone, Ornish, and Atkins. Um, stress is a big part of what a woman eats. And, uh, as a part of her lifestyle, whether or not she exercises that day or feels like exercising that day. And I think that this study showed it. Uh, this was a study of African American women in low socioeconomic groups. And when they had a 12 minute office visit with the doctor every month for six months, they were pretty successful in their program as it related to diet and exercise. But when the office visit stopped, um, they tend to gain weight. And that weight gain was associated with levels of stress. And the more stressed they were, the more likely they were to uh, eat foods that were high in fat, high in salt, high in sugar. So we're going to talk about the food mood connection a little bit. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Um, first we'll just visit the hormone changes in the period of call to transition. So in the SWAN study, which is an ongoing study, the SWAN stands for Study of Women Across uh, North America. They enrolled women uh, in their 40s to their early 50s, and they are following these women as they go through the period of causal transition. They are measuring their hormone levels, uh, they're measuring a lot of behavioral factors, and they're trying to characterize what changes with perimenopause. Well, the first event that occurs in the perimenopausal transition is not a decrease in estrogen like many of us have been conditioned to believe. It is a decrease in progesterone. And that initial decline in progesterone seems to be unrecoverable. It's not that the women have a decline in progesterone and then six months or a year later it bounces back up again. Once it begins its decline, it is a steady decline. And this definitely has a clinical impact. And this decline in progesterone can begin as early as the mid-30s. Most women will have a low progesterone in 
into uh, beginning in the 40s, in that decade leading up to menopause. Average age of menopause is 50. And so uh, another myth, I think, that the Swan study has uh, really eradicated is the fact that hormone levels can be abnormal even though menstrual cycles are regular. Now, I've had many patients show with me that they go to their doctor and say, I think I have a problem with my hormones. And the doctor says, well, are you having a cycle every month? And they say yes. And then they say, well, then it's not a problem with your hormones. But it absolutely can be a problem with hormones, even though they are having a regular menstrual cycle. Uh, stress, lifestyle, and dietary factors will all influence hormone levels and hormone function. And what we tend to see with estrogen levels in the Swan study is fluctuations, rapid fluctuations as women approach menopause. So in that decade leading up to menopause, one month they may have an estrogen level in the highest quintile, and the next cycle it may be in the lowest. And this type of erratic changes in the estrogen leads to lots of symptoms coupled with that decline in progesterone. So, what are some symptoms of uh, hormone changes? I don't know, we can try to get that slide again and see if it, it pops up in the um, Well, we'll visit this one again in a minute, but some symptoms that uh, some of you may have experienced uh, are hot flashes, night sweats, unexplained fatigue, unexplained aches and pains, changes in hair and skin, vaginal dryness, uh, sore, tender breast, food cravings, um, change in libido, these are, are some of the symptoms. Cold intolerance is another one, uh, constipation or bloating. Those are some hormone-related symptoms, and we'll visit that again in another slide. Um, so in talking about the food mood connection, on the left-hand uh, uh, part of the slide here, I have featured a GABA receptor. This is a GABA A receptor, and we all have GABA receptors in our central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. And Especially in the uh, cerebral cortex of the brain, yes, yeah, receptors affect our mood, our sense of well-being, of calmness. And you can see the different things that bind to GABA receptors. Well, there's a prescription drug that binds to the GABA receptors. Uh, that's a benzodiazepine. So brand names for benzodiazepine would be uh, Valium, Xanax, Ativan. Are these the name brands you all have? And we certainly see that in women in the age group 35 to 55, this is the peak time that they're prescribed those types of drugs. And it's a peak time for the diagnosis of depression, anxiety, as well as post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, what else binds to the GABA receptor? We uh, follow across, you can see the blue, uh, the blue cap there, it says steroid site. Well, the steroid that binds to the GABA A receptor is a metabolite of progesterone. So progesterone is very important as it relates to GABA A receptor stimulation. We uh, carry on across to the other side. Look what else binds to the GABA A receptors? Alcohol. And I certainly hear from my patients that they are drinking more or that alcohol seems to help when they get the hypersensitivity, hypervariability, difficulty in sleep. When I just say, if you notice that your alcohol consumption has increased, or if you notice that an extra glass of wine or two seems to calm you down, and well, yeah, I have noticed that. So, um, again, we, we see that women start to self medicate, maybe they have a progesterone deficiency, and they go to the doctor and get a prescription for their analytic, or they self medicate with alcohol. But the real underlying problem is low progesterone. And we can address that in a natural way. And I'm going to share that in a case study here in a little bit. Dopamine is another neurotransmitter in the brain that has a calming, feeling, feel good sensation when it's activated, uh, is food. And these are the kinds of foods that we tend to go for um, when we're having mood issues. Foods high in salt, high in sugar, high in fat. Um, Y'all have butter fingers up here, right? Uh, chips and so did. And the other thing that's interesting about Brian Wenzig's work, and he published this in Physiology and Behavior, is the differences among gender with comfort food. He actually went and explored uh, what types of comfort food men go for and what type of women go for. Now, what do you think the guys go for? 
meat, and potatoes, right? Hardy stews, casseroles, pizza. Those are hot foods that have to be prepared, right? Who has to prepare them? The women, right? And men tend to go for comfort foods when they're celebrating something. A hockey victory last night with Montreal, uh, or a promotion at work, or a big sale. That's what they tend to go for the comfort foods. Now, when do women tend to go for the comfort foods? Feeling stressed. Feeling tense, uh, feeling depressed, feeling blue, feeling anxious. When their mood is discord, is when they tend to go for that. And uh, what types of foods do women tend to comfort themselves with? Pastries, pies, chocolate, ice cream, cookie dough, um, things that don't have to be prepared, right? You can just pull it out of the refrigerator, the freezer, or the pantry. Uh, because, you know, if you're feeling bad, you don't, you don't want to prepare something for yourself to make yourself feel better. So, um, this is a pitfall, of course, with dieting because it doesn't really give women room to comfort themselves when they need to do so. Alright, so these are some things that some of my patients uh, tend to indulge in. Uh, do y'all have book clubs up here? Y'all go to book clubs? Wine clubs? <laughs> Uh, this is the Public Queens. They have a book club, and this is one of the desserts they serve at the book club. Um, you get a thawed pastry sheet, you put it on a cream sheet, you pile it high with Snickers and make a mountain in the center. You get it with a pastry bag, twist it, and brush it with butter. Make it until brown. Then you melt Milky Ways in the microwave, cross that, and you serve it with vanilla bluebell ice cream, which bluebell ice cream comes from Texas, by the way. If y'all haven't tried it, it's the big can. So, um, I was just shocked. I was like, you can eat that? So, um, next slide. I actually made one. This is what it looks like. And um, I couldn't eat it. It was just too sweet for me. But my teenage daughters and my husband ate it. Yeah. They did. Next slide. Okay, this is what they're drinking. These are called Miss Texas Martinis. You take tropical popsicles in flavored vodka. You select your popsicle and vodka, you unwrap it, put it in a pink plastic cup, pour two shots of vodka, dip it inside. <laughs> the recommendation was a mango popsicle with a great juice of vodka. Uh, next slide. And I did try that, and I didn't finish that one. <laughs> but again, this is the self medicating food issue. Okay, next slide. Um, so, sex hormones and women's health, I think that a lot of what's related uh, in the medical literature to sex hormones has to do with bikini medicine. And again, this is a lot of what doctors come in on. You know, have you had your mammogram, have you had your pap smear? Well, if you had your mammogram, have your pap smear, maybe your bone density and cholesterol, then hey, you're fine. You're good to go. See you next year. We're missing the moment. Women are more than the bikini area. We have hearts, we have brains. What is the leading cause of death and disability? Heart disease, cardiovascular disease. And so sex hormones uh, and sex hormone imbalance is going to impact all of this brain. The sex hormone activity in the brain affects our mood, our behavior, our sexual responsiveness, appetite, and the body. Sex hormones have analgesic anti-inflammatory roles in the nervous, muscular, scale, and immune systems. I've had several patients that have been diagnosed with MS. And they couldn't really prove it, but clinical suspicion. They had hormone imbalance. Once we replaced their progesterone and estriol, they didn't have the MS anymore. They didn't meet the clinical criteria for fibromyalgia or some of these conditions. Uh, car, cardiovascular activities include lowering triglycerides, dilating blood vessels, protecting its dysfunction of coronary vessels and, and even arrhythmias. <coughs> and then metabolically, the sex hormones boost metabolism. They have a diuretic function. They interact with glucose, insulin hormone, thyroid hormone, and cortisol. Sorry, we're not seeing that one, but those are symptoms. So when we talk about hormones then, naturally people assume that we're talking about synthetic hormones or HRT, and the best known HRT in the world is a drug called Permarin. And Permarin is a conjugated equine estrogen, and it comes from the urine of pregnant mares. And it's been uh, manufactured in the United States since the 1940s, and it is one of the most successful drugs ever one of the top 10 most heavily marketed drugs ever. 
And for decades, this is how we treated hormone symptoms in women, was by giving them primary. Uh, this is an advertisement for permanent medical journal from the 1950s, and I actually have this ad. But at that time, women that were fixed and on the primary hormone uh, would appear attractive, serene, uh, youthful, appropriately um, deferential to their husbands. Uh, husbands appeared financially successful and happy and satisfied. And uh, next slide shows the text for this ad. The position that puts a woman on program when she's suffering in the menopause makes her pleasant to live with once again. <laughs> it's no easy thing for a man to take the stings and marks of business life and then come home to the turmoil of his mind going through the change in life if she's not on program that is. And so, you know, with these kinds of promises, uh, what physician wouldn't be likely to prescribe this and what husband would be likely to want it uh, or patient if, if they saw this type of ad. Uh, here's a 2010 ad. So, man, is out of the picture. You know, and pause is hot now with Suzanne Summers, and we've seen this. And so here she is, and she is confident. And again, she's still attractive, stylishly dressed, uh, appears capable. And um, you can see, again, uh, Primarin, and they claim to be the most extensively studied and, and have the most widespread clinical experience, and that is true. But I am not comfortable with the recent findings related to these types of hormones. Uh, Primarin is oftentimes paired with another synthetic hormone called medroxyprogesterone acetate, or Provera. It might be called Primpro or Prim phase. And these hormones were the hormones that were studied in the Women's Health Initiative, which you probably heard about on the news and in some of the women's magazines and newspapers. And, uh, So as we talked about earlier, women have different health worries, and I just want to take a poll here tonight, and if you can look at these three types of health conditions, A is dementia, B is cardiovascular disease, such as heart attack or stroke, and C is breast cancer. I want you to be honest with yourself, and I just would like to show hands. We're going to ask about your personal health care, okay, not your fear for your sister, but your personal health care. So how many of you would say dementia is your greatest personal health fear? And how many of you would say cardiovascular disease? And how many of you would say breast cancer? So we've got a pretty even mix here tonight. So uh, the leading cause of death and disability in women worldwide is cardiovascular disease. We look globally at women's health. She has a one in two chance of becoming disabled from cardiovascular disease or dying from cardiovascular disease. One in 20 from breast cancer. But um, women have different health fears and I don't think that we would want to use a drug that is going to increase the risk of any of those conditions. And the synthetic hormones were shown to increase the risk of cardiovascular disease of dementia, as well as breast cancer. <laughs> health in the next slide. So, um, <coughs> sorry about the print here, but um, when we look at data from the Women's Health Initiative, from the Million Women Study, from the Nurses' Health Study, and HERS 1, which these were all very large scale clinical trials, we see um, an, an increased risk of uh, heart disease and stroke, dementia, blood clots, and breast cancer. We see a decreased risk of fracture and colon cancer, but I don't think that that decrease is substantial enough to incur the risk of these other adverse events, which women have uh, fear of. And I think that a lot of our continued use of HRT, despite the findings of all of these studies, has to do with the promotion and marketing of these drugs. I know y'all don't have to direct to consumer advertising here, but we certainly have it in the States. And they really play on the fact that a consumer identifies with the product or with the image and is likely to ask their physician for that prescription. And we published a paper on this in 2006 just showing this effect of marketing despite the lack of good science or even negative science on something. If physicians are marketed uh, about that product, they're likely to prescribe the product. 
And so I just want to compare and contrast the, the progesterones here because even a lot of physicians don't understand the difference between these two. The only place that they have the same effect in the female body is in the uterus. If you look down to number three, they both can induce changes in the uterus in response to estrogen. So in that particular tissue, they have the same effect physiologically and pharmacologically. But everywhere else in the body, there are different effects. The synthetics don't uh, occur naturally in humans. Uh, they have harmful effects on the cardiovascular system. They're associated with depression and headaches, insomnia, bloating, acne. They increase blood clot risk, stroke risk, breast cancer risk, dementia risk, and more than half of women stop taking them due to side effects. When we look at the natural progesterone, we see that they improve cardiovascular functions, they improve quality of life, sleep, and mood. They do not increase the risk of stroke or cancer, and that they are indeed preferred by women. I was never thanked by a patient's family for prescribing the synthetic hormones. I can't tell you how many thank yous I've received since I changed my clinical practice and started using the natural biomedical hormones. Uh, the patients are very thankful and appreciative. Their husbands, their co-workers, their kids, just thanks, thanks for helping my mom, my wife. She's now in Maryland, she feels so much better. Next slide. So here's how the hormone restoration model works. The patient comes in, she undergoes testing for an accurate assessment of her endogenous hormones, and then there's precise prescribing of individualized doses, what she needs as relates to bioidentical hormones, along with nutritional and lifestyle counseling, and then the hormone levels are monitored to remain in the physiologic range. Next slide. So here she's asking, has anyone seen my hormones? Where do we look for the hormones? The place that I look is in the saliva. I was certainly trained to do serum testing, but serum testing is not an accurate assessment of endogenous hormone production. It's not reflective of what's happening in the tissue, except in extreme situations. And most of my patients aren't at the extreme. They're somewhere in the middle, but they're hormonally imbalanced. And many, many women that I care for have already had serum testing done, and they've already been told that their levels are all normal and it's not the and when I do the salivary hormone analysis, we see that there are abnormalities, and I see very good concordance between what they report, what I observe clinically, and what I see on the hormone profile. Next slide. So the serum uh, hormones, they have a very broad therapeutic uh, window. They don't have good sensitivity and specificity in these low analyte ranges. Next slide. Uh, here's the advantages to bioidentical hormones. We don't see the same incidence of side effects. They, they can be affordable and convenient for the patient. They do mimic the effects of the endogenous hormones in the body. Next slide. And with the triad, uh, we have the pharmacist that is compounding bioidentical hormones working together with the physician and the patient in uh, communication to find out what works best for her. Next slide. So using this model of care, when I first began testing patients, the most common pattern that we saw was low progesterone. And if you think back to those first few slides I showed you, what did they all three have in common? Low progesterone levels, both with the gynec obesity with the uh, android obesity. And so in this particular study, we just looked at the use of a transdermal that gets rubbed into the skin, progesterone, and its effect on these uh, cardiovascular markers related to stroke risk and heart attack risk in postmenopausal women. Next slide. Oh, there's a comment. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Go um, ahead. The, I think he wants to do questions at the end, but we can do them on the other side. How do they make the bioidentical progesterone? How do they make the bioidentical progesterone? Uh, we'll let uh, okay. Anne Marie, a compounding pharmacist, talk a little bit about that at the end. But they come from plant sources. So they are, and the chemical structure is identical to the chemical structure of the progesterone that is manufactured in the ovaries. Um, okay, so, wow, sorry, I don't know what's going on with the slide. Um, women don't just need progesterone, however. So uh, we have a clinical study, and this is a three year study. Where we're looking at women between the ages of 30 and 70, we 
undergo testing, and then they are given hormone supplement, compounded by women's hormones, based on what they need. Because every woman is different. Yes, they all need progesterone. When I test patients, progesterone is low in 99% of them. Um, but some need DHEA, some are fine. DHEA. They just need progesterone. Some need estrogen and progesterone and DHEA. Some need estrogen, progesterone, DHEA, and testosterone. So we're looking at all of these hormones and effects on all of these different biomarkers. Next slide. Um, in this study, it's called the CHOICE study. We have patients coming from all over uh, the state and even other states to participate. There are 150 women in the world in this clinical study. And the University of Texas Health Science Center is located east of Dallas. So that just kind of gives y'all a perspective. Anybody here ever been to Texas? A, a few where? Fort Worth. That was more than Fort Worth. Cowtown. What about you? San Antonio. San Antonio, beautiful place. Riverwalk. Yeah, those yes. are great places to visit. Next slide. <laughs> so this is what we found in the CHOICE study. Now, using these uh, plant-derived compounding hormones, we see a decrease in blood pressure, decrease in fibrocystic changes in the breast, decrease in blood sugar levels, decreases in depression and anxiety scores, decrease in pain scores, decrease in triglycerides, decrease in inflammatory and clotting factors, as well as a decrease in hormone-related symptoms. Now, our hypothesis was that we would see an improvement in some areas uh, because of uh, uh, the data that I've shared with you before, but we were astounded to see these statistically significant changes really head to toe in our patients using this model of care. Next. And so we presented our initial data at uh, American Heart Association in 2007. This was published in Circulation, which is a cardiology journal. Next slide. Uh, our next study was published in Arteriosclerosis, Thrombosis, and Vascular Biology in 2008. And I share this with you so that talk with your doctor about this. I mean, this is not alternative medicine that we're talking about here. This is science-based. This is evidence-based. And these are peer-reviewed journals. Next slide. Uh, our next study was published in circulation in 2008. Next slide. And this particular paper was uh, selected from one of 32 papers from over 4,000 papers for a news release. And so we got recognition from the American Heart Association scientific sessions on the relevance of our work and the quality of our work as 50 million women in the U.S. approach menopause. And we conducted interviews with WebMD, MedScape, Family Practice News, Cardiology News, OBGYN News. Uh, and you can go to my website. I think all of you got a bookmark that has my website on it. It's awakeningandpena.com. And uh, you can read these interviews if you would like to do so. Uh, our, our most recent publication was published in Hypertension Journal, and this was looking at the blood pressure levels in these patients, uh, as well as their job strain and home strain. Like we talked about earlier, stress impacts a woman's health. And women with high job stress or high home stress, or sometimes both, are very uh, vulnerable to changes as it relates to cardiovascular physiology. And I can't fix the fact that their father-in-law has dementia and has to be that their uh, son has cerebral palsy or that their husband lost his job. But in women that are highly stressed, one way that I can assist is through trying to achieve balance, hormone balance, because even in the face of these stressors, hormone balance is going to buffer some of the adverse effects on the immune system, on the inflammatory uh, factors. And so uh, this study just showed that in women with high jaw and high home strength scores, that were pre-hypertensive, using this model of care, we saw a blood pressure lowering effect. We saw a favorable effect. Next slide. So let's get into some case studies, and then we're going to have time for some questions and answers. I will tell you that in my book, I have over 60 case studies where I talk about things just like these. So if these are helpful for you, you might want to explore that further. Uh, this first patient, she's 32. Here are her symptoms. She's got weight gain, joint pain, uh, due to a condition of psoriatic arthritis. She had been placed on drugs such as Tocumax, methotrexate, and Remicade that had side effects, and so just stopped taking all of them. Uh, 
Uh, she's on an oral contraceptive because she has irregular menstrual cycles. She suffers from fatigue, poor sleep quality, and worsening PMS. So her current medications are the oral contraceptive, ibuprofen, which she takes from joint pain, and occasional supplements. She's got a history of psoriatic arthritis. She's had two pregnancies, two deliveries, vaginal deliveries, ages 19 and 22, some breastfeeding. You can see that she's had a few surgeries. She's had her gallbladder out, and she's had a tubal ligation. Her parents have hypertension and a sibling with bipolar disorder. Now, looking at her social history, she's high school educated, living with her spouse and two children in the household, married for 14 years, working full time, watching three hours of TV a day, volunteering eight hours a week, no exercise, no tobacco, no alcohol, no fun. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> she eats a soccer mom diet because neither of her kids drive, so she's running them around. Drinks four to five sodas a day. She says, I'm too tired to exercise or cook. You ever heard of a situation like Uh, on her physical exam and lab findings, her body mass index is 39, and so that is in the obese range. Her blood pressure is elevated at 138 over 86. That's now considered pre-hypertension. Her waist circumference is too high. Look at that, 41 inches. Remember, we want it 35, less than 35 inches. And her waist hip ratio is elevated 0.82. On physical exam, her thyroid is enlarged. She's got thyroid-assisted changes in her breast. Uh, when I touch her hands and feet, they're ice cold. She's got some uh, severe psoriasis and thinning scalp hair. Uh, these studies down here are just looking at her anxiety and depression and mood scores as well as pain scores. So she's got mild to moderate mood and pain symptoms. And then over on the right hand side, you can see her laboratory findings. So her TSH, that's one of the thyroid functions that we measure, is elevated. So patient is hypothyroid, hasn't been treated for it, a lot of the labs will set the normal level at 5. Now, I'm not sure how a laboratory is reported in Canada. I know some of your units are different, but you can uh, seek this out and make sure that your thyroid functions are in line. You can see that her T3 is low. TSH is high, that means she needs thyroid supplement. Her triglycerides are high, her C-reactive protein is high, her set rate is high, fasting glucose and fasting insulin are high. She has a, a high level of insulin resistance. Her vitamin D is extremely low. Her vitamin B12 is low. And on health ultrasound, she's got a very cyst. <coughs> and she's been going to her doctor's appointments every four months. It seems they miss some things. Women have to be their advocate in the healthcare encounters. I'm going to talk about that. So do I stop there? No. I don't want to know what's going on with sex hormones. You say she's only 32. Yes, she's 32, but she's got symptoms and findings and we need to delve further into her hormone profile. So her estrogen level is normal, her progesterone is low, and her progesterone to estrogen ratio is extremely low. Look at her androgens, testosterone and DHEAS. They're both elevated. So no wonder she's got the hair loss, the acne, the weight changes. Look at her stress hormone levels. She's normal in the morning, normal at noon, elevated in the evening, and then uh, falls again at bedtime. So overall, this type of stress hormone pattern is not bad for women with children in the home. Because what are they doing at 4 or 5 in the afternoon? They're starting their second shift, right? The second day, the double day. They, have, they get up, they go to work, they go to the office, the hospital, the school, and then what? They pick up the kids, and it's the cooking and the cleaning, the laundry, the PTA meetings, the dentist, dry cleaner, post office, men, you know, finally get home. And uh, so she's starting her double day. So, what would I recommend for this patient? I'm going to recommend progesterone. That's what she needs. And I have my patients take a low dose in the first part of, of their cycle, days 1 through 10, and then they double that dose or even triple that dose in the second part of the cycle. We're mimicking the normal physiology. I'm going to start her on thyroid supplementation. She needs vitamin D. She needs vitamin B. And these are some supplements. I noticed that we have some supplements on the table tonight. I'm a member of the American Botanical Society. I use a lot of herbs and supplements in our practice. I know we've got a natural pathway in the audience that would certainly focus on that too. And these are uh, helpful for insulin resistance as well as for the arthritis and helpful for fatigue. 
Um, there are good quality clinical studies supporting the use of these types of supplements. And I've uh, talked with her about nutrition as well as uh, lifestyle factors. One of the first things that, that, that I do with patients is just ask them to simply get a pedometer. Do any of y'all have a pedometer? Do you ever wear it? Okay, sometimes. Um, because just bringing some consciousness to the sedentary lifestyle is helpful. I know women are exhausted, but look at her, she's a secretary, she sits all day at work, and then she sits all day in the car as she'd be running her kids around, you know, after school, and she sits for three hours watching TV trying to unwind at night. So she's not moving much. And just by uh, starting a goal of even 2,500 steps a day at that first visit and building that up, that can be very helpful. Uh, Pedometer use has been associated with getting women more active, helping uh, to decrease their weight, and has favorable changes on blood pressure. Next slide. Uh, this is how I want my patients eating. Are y'all familiar with the Mediterranean diet, Mediterranean pyramid? Uh, there's a good website for this. I have it in my book. Uh, it's Old Ways. That's O L D W A Y S P T, like Paul Tom. Old Ways, P T dot org, and you can get the traditional Mediterranean. There's a vegetarian Mediterranean. There's an Asian. There's a Latin American. There's a kids version. But this is a cheap, convenient way to eat. And eating this way has been shown to be cancer protective as well as cardio protective. Protected. Um, I might not be able to get a woman to change to benefit only herself, but if she perceives that she's benefiting her children, she's more likely to make that behavioral change. And we have a lot of data now as it relates to kids and eating out. And the adverse effects of eating out too often. This particular study, eating out four or more times a week. This was second graders through 11th graders uh, studying in Wisconsin. They ate out four or more times a week. They already had changes on their lipids and insulin levels um, that were setting them up for future problems of cardiovascular disease. And they included eating in the school cafeteria as eating out. Next slide. So another study looked at um, the effects of eating five meals a week at home and the effects on middle schoolers and teenagers. And they found that in girls that ate at home five times a week in middle school. When they got into high school, they were less likely to use tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana. And so there's some type of social protective effect that goes on here. It's not just the content of the food because it happens to be less processed to the little eating at home, but also um, the social cohesiveness. Next slide. Um, one thing that uh, we've done at home is <coughs> the Aero Garden. Has anybody heard of the Aero Garden? Do you have one? You can have a garden on your kitchen counter. And uh, this is something that teachers can use in the classroom that you can have in place in business. Uh, but I think it's, it's helpful to just, in a very small way, uh, start bringing some awareness and consciousness. And so you get your little seed pods, and I bought the stainless steel and black one because that matched my kitchen better, but it comes in a lot of different uh, this is my oldest daughter watering the garden. This is after four weeks. This is growing peppers and tomatoes. And you know, up here in Nova Scotia, we have all the snow. Something like this might work, right? It's got the lights on the top that uh, help everything grow. You can grow strawberries, uh, peppers. You can grow herbs, different kinds of lettuce. Next slide. Um, another thing that I prescribe for my patients is film. Uh, several years ago, I started prescribing films as an affordable, accessible, practical therapy to help patients better understand their intimate relationships, beliefs, and interactions with the outer world. Um, sometimes I may be able to deliver a message more effectively through a film than um, I can in that office visit. I'm pretty successful in getting patients to see a film before they come back for their next visit. Uh, less successful in getting them to read the books. Um, this is not a film I recommend for her. This is a movie that I worked on with Steve Martin and Liam Neeson, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. They filmed this in the Panhandle of Texas. It was called Leap of Faith. This is the film that I recommend for this patient, Super Size Me. Anybody seen this movie? Yeah. Okay, almost all of them have seen it. But if, um, I know it's kind of an extreme version. The gentleman was followed by a gastroenterologist, cardiologist, and internist, and he ate all his meals at McDonald's for 30 days. Looked at the adverse 
effects on his health. But I do think it brings some awareness and consciousness when we are feeding our kids like this on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. So uh, she comes back from a fall, but she's got lifting and fatigue, improvement in her sleep, a decrease in joint pain. She's having periods. Oh, and by the way, I stopped the birth control pills. Remember, she's already had a tumor ligation. The birth control pills increase those inflammatory factors, some of the triglycerides and things that we received, so those stopped. Uh, Romensis has been between uh, 32 and 38 days. Thyroid function is in range. No side effects of the progesterone or the thyroid or the supplements. And you can see that everything is looking much better as it relates to the inflammatory and metabolic factors. Next slide. Um, I, I don't know why it's doing this. I guess it's because I'm using her life talk. Um, anyway, here she is at 12 months, and, and this is again just to demonstrate the progress that we've made over 12 months using this model of care. She feels better, she has more energy, less pain, and, and her psoriasis has improved. Next slide. So uh, here's her hormone profile after 12 months. Her estrogen is in range, her progesterone is in range, the ratio between the progesterone and estrogen is normal. Her testosterone and DHEs have come down because this is part of the body's response. When we supplement the progesterone, we're going to see a decrease in androgens if they do have too much androgens on the board. And you can see that her stress hormone level looks good. Next slide. Um, type of exercise that I recommend for my patients is yoga. Anybody here practicing yoga? Oh, this is wonderful. Um, is there a yoga center here? Are y'all doing it at home? Or we have a yoga teacher here? But with yoga, you get that body-mind connection. And we actually did some clinical research with yoga. This was just a once a week, hour and a half class of working women. And we found statistically significant improvement in many quality of life uh, factors. We published this in 2004, next slide. And what I like about yoga is it's totally mobile. So if a woman gets, has to get on a plane and, and go stay in a nursing home for two weeks, you know, with her dad, or her daughter has a baby and has got to go stay in a small apartment. And she can take the yoga. You can do it in an airport. You can do it in a hospital room. You can do it in a hotel room. And I personally have benefited from yoga for 15 years. And I can take it on the road with me. And of course, it does embarrass my kids a little when I do it in an airport. But um, a lot of the, just the yoga breaths you can do when you're sitting at a stoplight driving down the highway. And uh, these are some of the benefits of yoga. Next slide. Um, Neuropsychological learning, memory, mood, sleep, balance, metabolically helping with energy levels and cravings. Uh, for women with cardiovascular or pulmonary disease or musculoskeletal disease, it's very important that they're in a yoga program. If you've never done yoga, you need to have beginner instruction initially. And after you learn some of the poses, postures, you can have a home based program. Next slide. So let's go to our second page. She's 67. She's got uh, symptoms of hot flashes followed by severe sweating. She puts her hand in the freezer when this happens. Now, I guess it's so cold up here that y'all don't really have to do that much. Oh, yeah, we do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's got headaches, vaginal dryness, dysphoric mood, weight gain. She's the heaviest weight ever. Cognitive changes, increased joint pain, poor sleep, food cravings, dry hair, dry skin. She had natural menopause at age 48. She was on Permit for two years, and then she was switched to Prim Pro. And she states an inability to effectively communicate with the physician. She says, I told him this, but he just keeps writing the same prescriptions. You know, every time. Just not as heavy as well, you're just getting old. Okay. Um, so, uh, in the interest of time, we'll go on and speak through that in the next slide. So these are the medicines she's on. She's on bisphosphonate for osteopenia. She's been on seven years, on a statin for five years, on synthetic thyroid for 10 years, and low pressure medicine for 15 years, and proxy inhibitor for 15 years. And this is the kind of spiral that we tend to see in midlife women. You know, they start out and they're doing pretty well, but then they may have a regular period, so they're put on hormones or birth control, and they, they gain weight, become depressed, so they're put on um, antidepressant, anxiolytic, statin, in anti-inflammatory drugs, and we see this kind of downward spiral. So in a matter of 10 or 15 years, they gain 10 or 15 or 20 pounds, and they're on 8 or 10 or 12 prescription drugs, and they're at their highest weight ever, and they feel worse than they've ever felt in their lives. 
and this is a common thing that I hear. Um, so she's got osteopenia, hypertension, hypothyroidism, and osteoarthritis, had a couple of surgeries, long had a history of liver cancer, colon cancer, and now has dementia, died, dad died of lung cancer. She's been retired for five years, high school education, living with her husband, no pets, no exercise, no tobacco, no alcohol, eats at home, four cans of soda a day, she's a caregiver for her mom. Uh, she's got decreased stamina as well as these abnormal skin sensations, kind of like bug crawling or electrical shock sensations she describes. Next slide. Uh, on physical exam, she's obese, her blood pressure is okay, waist circumference is high, she looks older than her state of age, her thyroid is enlarged, she's got fiber system changes in the breast, she's got uh, atrophic changes in the vagina, and she's got a neurodermatitis skin condition. She's got moderate anxiety scores and severe hormone-related symptom scores. You can look over the right-hand side and see that even though she's on a thyroid preparation, her thyroid is still out of balance when you do the thyroid testing. T3 is too low, TSH is too high. And then her triglycerides are high, her C-reactive protein is elevated, her glucose and insulin are elevated, insulin resistance is elevated, IGF-1 is low, this is a measure of healthy aging that I use, and then her liver functions are elevated, likely due to the staph, and her vitamin D is too low. So there's a lot of room for improvement here. And too bad her internist hasn't even investigated any of this for the last whatever many years. We're gonna stop there? No, we're gonna see what's happening with her hormones. So you can see that her estrogen is low, just in the base, but not even detectable, less than 0 0.5. Same with progesterone. Testosterone is low, and THES is very low. The cortisol is high, <coughs> she drops pretty rapidly and then it's pretty flat. And patients that have this kind of pattern, they tell me, if I've got to get something done, I've got to get it done in the morning. Or once I sit down, that's it. I can't get up to get going again. You know, just kind of run out of gas. Next slide. So here are her diagnoses listed at the top and how am I going to treat her? Well, I'm going to give her a compound of bioidentical hormones with estrogen. I actually use two estrogens. 80% estriol, 20% estradiol, combined with progesterone, combined with DHEA. And compound pharmacists can put it all together in one cream, and she uh, delivers that to the skin either once a day or twice a day. And I'm going to give her a vaginal suppository of estriol made by the compound pharmacists to help with the atrophic changes, as well as a vitamin D cream that she's going to rub on once a week to the fatty area of the skin. These are some of the supplements that I recommend. And because she has been on the synthetic hormones so long, we don't need to just stop in like this. If we do, she's going to have severe withdrawal type symptoms, uh, discontinuation syndrome type problems. We have to gradually taper back. And sometimes it's six months, sometimes it's nine months, sometimes even 12 months when these women have been on the synthetics long term. <coughs> and then, uh, uh, recommend lifestyle yoga and hand work. Next slide. Um, I'm going to stop her bisphosphonate. First of all, she doesn't even have osteoporosis. And second of all, if you've been on those drugs for five years, uh, the data says you can stop it. You know, these drugs are super expensive. They have a lot of side effects. And so I spend more time stopping than starting uh, the bisphosphonates in my patients. Next slide. So she comes back. She's got improvement in most symptoms. She said that she's still got some persistent fatigue. And this is related to caregiver stress. And do y'all have the assisted living centers here for the patients to live in where they go to the dining room for the meals and they have like a little apartment? Okay. So remember her mom's got mentioned she was in assisted living. But this is what's happened with this patient as it relates to her mom. If her mom goes to the dining room and doesn't like what they're having for breakfast, she calls daughter. Daughter prepares breakfast and brings it up to assisted living for her mom. Same with lunch, same with dinner. Uh, mom doesn't like the way they do her laundry at the assisted living, so daughter has to carry the laundry back and forth. And also, mom is on the phone with daughter five, six, seven, eight times a day, according to the husband. When he pulled me out in the hall to, you know, give me the download and all this stuff. So, um, it was time to set some limits, you know, as related to this relationship. Um, you can see her anxiety, depression, and Food scores improved, quality of life scores improved, and we see improvement on those inflammatory.
inflammatory and metabolic factors. Um, in fact, everything is coming down into range. Next slide. Um, her hormone levels, the estrogen, the progesterone are in range, and the HES is in range. Next slide. And uh, so this is what, uh, I have a read a book um, about mothers and daughters. Uh, Deborah Tienan has done a lot of research in this area, and that mother-daughter relationship is one of the strongest relationships that I've ever encountered in clinical practice, and it does persist beyond the grave. And even if the daughter is 70 and the mother is 90, there can still be issues. There are three things that mothers criticize their daughters about that make their daughters feel, you know, just total failures. Anybody want to guess what the three things are? Yeah, what you're wearing, your wardrobe, your hair, and your weight. So the mom makes a remark about any of those, you know, those are just button pushers. Um, so you're wearing that, and then limitations on the phone visits and on the assisted living visits. And she really needed to get into balance here because this was very much affecting her personal health and her marriage and her husband's retirement. And he said, our since we bought an RV two years ago, we've never taken him anywhere because she won't leave her mother. And her mother's not coming with us. <laughs> um, you know, so giving her permission to set these limits and say, you are still a good daughter if you only talk to your mom once a day. I mean, if it's a huge emergency, they're going to get a hold of it. But if it's, you know, flatly not, it's an abusive type relationship. Uh, get her into support group for caregivers. And I said, you are going to plan a trip and go on a trip in the RV with your husband before your next visit. And if you don't do it, don't even come back and say, you've got to go. Get in that RV. Get out there. Give them your brother's phone number if this is living. All right, next slide. So um, she comes back at 12 months, and her standard mood and pain her improved. She knows occasional hot flashes. It says these are stress-related. Now she's taking two trips. In the RV, and mom didn't die, or you know, throw the pregnancy food, everything went along smoothly at assisted living. And um, I know you can't see your bottom markers, but they are in a favorable range. Next slide. Um, you can see her hormone levels are in range, and remember, mom had a history of uterine cancer, and she was on unopposed program for a time, the patient was, and so uh, just looking at the uterine ultrasound, we do not see a problem with endometrial hyperplasia, which is a precursor to endometrial cancer with the bioidenticals. That's certainly been associated with the synthetic hormones. Next slide. Um, and so I'm going to uh, close with this, and then we're going to have some questions and answers and comments. Uh, this is currently my academy's position statement on hormone therapy. This is the American Academy of Family Physicians, and this is what they have to say. Gone are the days when the physician decided whether a woman should or should not get HRT, which drug she should get, and which she should stop using them based on her age or the presence or absence of her uterus. Collaborative decision making has replaced this process. The physician's role is to be an information provider and a counselor, helping each woman look at the data through the lens of her own situation, helping her stratify her personal risk and balance potential benefits against those risks. The response you make necessarily shifts to the woman herself as a what she can balance her quality of life against the risk she's willing to accept. And um, that uh, is the position. So I agree with that position statement. I, I do think our role is as a counselor, information provider, pharmacists, uh, other healthcare professionals, nurse practitioners can be beneficial in this process, but ultimately the choice is yours. And um, I think that bioidentical hormones is a good choice, a good option to make as the scientific data currently stands. And so I'm happy to answer any questions or have comments. Yes? After you start on the hormone replacement, how long before you should have a repeat done in your saliva testing? Okay, after you start on the hormone uh, therapy, how long should you wait before you have another follow-up saliva test? I recommend a minimum of 60 days, just because of the promiscuity of the hormones. DHEA can be converted to estrogen, it can also be converted to testosterone, and you want everything to kind of settle down to see what's going to happen in this patient. So I don't retest any sooner than 60 days. Now a lot of times the patients want me to test because they say, oh I'm feeling great, I'm feeling so much better. Let's do a test and see how things look, let's see if I'm balanced. 
but I, I wait at least 60 days. If everything's fine in 60 days, then I will check once a year. Um, and uh, if it's not, you know, we may have to check a time or two more. We might just have to look at part of the one on part of the part uh, that we're focusing on that we're receiving some imbalance. So obviously this uh, testing is covered in the U.S.? It's not covered um, No, she said this testing is covered in the U.S. Um, not necessarily. Some of the patients' insurances do uh, reimburse for saliva testing, uh, but most of my patients, they're willing to pay because they want to know what's happening in their body. They want to know what's happening with them, and they want the most accurate way of investigating them. And so we work with them to find a way you know, for them to, to be able to have that test. Um, Medicare was paying for it, but then they stopped paying for it a few months ago. So that's the status there. Yes? Um, how do you get your doctor to test you? I've tried before. Uh, yeah, how do you get your doctor to test you? I've tried before and I thought it was crazy. Um, I know that sometimes the, the medicine here may not be as consumer driven as it is in the United States. You know, we have private practice there and, and people are competing against each other. And when really the consumer is the patient and you're the driver and they have a choice, but I understand here you get assigned and there's issues related to that. Um, I would just encourage you to be as forthright as possible and, and say, even if you don't believe in this test, it's my body, it's my life, it's my choice, and I feel like that I need to have this test in order to help me make some decisions. Um, you know, you can get the test kits at pharmacies. Yeah, but I don't have to get them to prescribe. Mm -hmm. but, but a healthcare professional needs to give you permission. Yes. Uh, um, you can get, you can do home kits for blood type or cholesterol or blood sugar. You know, this you is no different. To be just to satisfy me after I bought them now. Yes. Uh, blood work, again, is probably normal. It almost always is. Um, I, um, the fervent prayer of a righteous man a bell for lunch. You know, you might just keep on keep the door and keep pestering and asking or get the nurse to then decide off the time. Finally they'll just say, okay, you know. Uh, ultimately you may have to change providers if you just feel like you're they're not communicating. Um, you know, to print out the position statement from the American Academy of Family Physicians and say, this really resonates with me and this is what's going on in the States and I want to be part of my health and I don't know, maybe some other comments here. That's just about where it stands. Yeah. I think it's your choice and you have to demand it. And um, I would keep demanding it. Yes? Um, my doctor, we didn't go for the slab test. He did blood work. And he did get, give me a prescription for the uh, form of biodental therapy. And I was on it for about three months, and it worked great at first, and then it just stopped working. What would you say to that? Yeah, um, she said that she did have testing. She had serum testing, and then her doctor prescribed out the hormones. I didn't have the saliva test. Yeah, not the saliva test. It, it seemed to work for a few months, and then it seemed to stop working. Well, um, I, you know, I have no idea what dose you were on or, or what the combination was. Um, I think each patient is, uh, has to be treated individually and of course stress factors, uh, dietary and lifestyle factors all impact the hormone milieu. Uh, sometimes I see that there's a problem with the compound itself. My patients want to save money and they go you know, to the bottom dollar place or they do a mail order and I said, because I was just saying, where are you getting your compound? Oh well, I changed and I mailed it into so and so. And we've done random testing with some of those, uh, sending them to an analytical lab looking for quality and potency, and, and they really fall short. You know, so it matters where you obtain the compound. Sometimes the base changes that the pharmacist is preparing it in, and even that base change can affect how well, how well you absorb it. Uh, now, were you on pills or were you on um, no, cream. the cream? Yeah, so sometimes the base uh, is a factor. Um, sometimes there's an initial upregulation of estrogen receptors and then there's a downregulation when you're giving progesterone.
And so you have to make a change three to four months down the road based on, you know, like we talked about in 60 days, what's happened with the, with the receptors. Um, I, I didn't talk about all of my clinical studies, and, um, but I, I do think it's important as women go into their 60s, 70s, uh, 80s, and beyond that they be hormonally balanced as it relates to dementia risk and other quality of life factors. So I would say I wouldn't give up. If, if you truly are deficient in some area and need some support, I, I, would, have, I would be reassessed. I think it's, it's extremely important. Yes, in blue. Is the a personal history of breast cancer, is that a, a problem with taking the, the hormone replacement? Is a personal history of breast cancer a problem with taking the bioidenticals? Um, we have our patients sign a special consent if they have a history of breast cancer. Um, just because our legal counsel is, is really hypersensitive about all of this. And the hormones, even the bioidentical hormones, may be carcinogens. Now, I think keeping the progesterone and estrogen ratio in balance is very important. I think DHEA is extremely important. Looking at glucose insulin is important as far as preventing uh, occurrence. Um, but I do have breast cancer survivors that have, I've assessed and have used the hormone restoration model of care. If you read Dr. Zava's book, um, What Your Doctor May Not Tell You About Breast Cancer and How Hormone Balance May Save Your Life, I know it's a big mouthful, but it's by Dr. David Zava. Uh, what Your Doctor May Not Tell You About Breast Cancer. I think that's a good resource that goes into uh, breast cancer risk. And um, I have not had any patients, you know, have recurrence, but I don't have, I mean, I don't have thousands of breast cancer survivors on this regimen, so I can't attest to that. Dr. Rebecca Glazer, a G-L-A-S-E-R, um, has a large cohort of breast cancer survivors. Uh, she practices in Ohio, and she uses a lot of testosterone in breast cancer survivors, and she thinks keeping that testosterone up is really key as it relates to um, prevention. Um, she's got a you know, much larger caseload of breast cancer survivors than I have in my practice, and she's very comfortable with the biomedicals as long as our goal is physiologic reference range and we stay in balance. Mm -hmm. uh, G, how do you spell that again? G-L-A-S-E-R. Dr. Rebecca plays Okay, lady in the stripes. In the stripes. <laughs> How do you know, in taking the whole bioidentical process thing, how do you know at what point you can stop? Or you're ready to stop? I don't want to stop yeah. and then find out, oh, you should have stopped. Uh, in the whole bioidentical hormone process, how do you know when to stop? Well, when I look at the data, um, I'm not planning personally to stop because I want the cardio protection, the neuro protection, the anti inflammatory benefits. Through hormones, I don't have to go take other drugs to get this type of benefit when I can do it in a natural way. Um, our study is uh, it's called the MAD study. It's looking at mood, aging, uh, dementia, and cognitive dysfunction in people 60 and older. Uh, we found that hormone imbalances correlated with cognitive impairment and with depressed mood and decreased quality of life. And so I think it's important for, for all the decades. Now, the oldest patient that I prescribed hormones for was 92. Um, she was on her way to the senior dance. She came in in a beautiful red dress, and red high heels, and a red headband. And, you know, she, her legs looked like a 20-year-old. But it's her choice. You know, just like my academy says, it's her choice to weigh the risk and benefits. Now, if we are going to use hormones, I'm going to use the bioidentical. But I think as long as you're monitoring and keeping in the physiological range, you're going to minimize risk. Not to say that, it, that it's not uh, possible to have some risk down the road. We're not going to protect and prevent against everything. But so many inflammatory conditions in women, uh, dementia, osteoarthritis, uh, diabetes, hypertension, and we know that these are anti-inflammatory agents and affect those pathways. I think it makes sense to I, I don't think there's a stop. Until unless the patient says I want to stop or something. 
That's my, I can't do the study on that, but it's only in that. Yes. Last year I had the saliva test done, and I barely registered for um, progesterone and uh, estrogen. So I went on to the bioidenticals, and I felt miserable the whole year. And I just got retested. My progesterone came up 50%, but my estrogen only 10. And I don't know, I don't know why it wouldn't come up more. Okay, so she's saying she had a situation where you had saliva testing, you started taking in estrogen and progesterone, peel or cream? Cream. Cream. And then you were retested a year later, and your progesterone came up some, but the estrogen didn't come up much. And then you didn't really have symptom relief? No. But, okay. So did you check your DHEA and your testosterone and your cortisol? Yes. Okay, and all those were in line? Amory. <laughs> were they in line? <laughs> so, okay. I think it's important you know, to look at the full profile. Um, in those situations, um, I might look, we can measure all three estrogens. We can measure estrone, estriol, and estradiol. We usually just measure the estradiol. Sometimes I find that those patients, we need to look very uh, particularly at the type of estrogen and the ratio of estrogen. Sometimes they'll feel better with a 50% estriol, 50% estradiol. Um, so I wouldn't give, give up. If you really work low well with what you were doing on your own is not sufficient, then you want to find something that you can, can tolerate and the right mix of the estrogen. Yes. If you've had a hysterectomy or more prone to heart disease, if they remove your ovaries, women that undergo ovarectomy have not only increased risk of cardiovascular disease, but increased risk of all causes of mortality. They don't live as long. They they have more health problems over time. Now, there's a Scottish study where they looked at women with um, premature menopause, and particularly at blood pressure and cardiovascular pathways having to do with the renal angiotensin system, and they put them on two different regimens. One was birth control synthetic hormones, the other was the bioidentical hormones, vaginal and transdermal. And they found that the natural hormones, or they call them physiologic sex-specific hormone regimen, had a very favorable effect on the cardiovascular So I, I don't think it's, it's uh, inevitable. I think that you can protect against some of that increased risk through hormone balance and using the transdermal uh, bioidentical hormones. But yes, women that have had ovaries removed or increased risk of cardiovascular disease, connective tissue diseases, um, uh, all cause mortality in the, in the epidemiological and it used to be that the doctors always removed the, the ovaries when they did hysterectomy because that was common practice in the States. I don't know if it was here, but they did a lot of that. Now they tend to leave them more often because of, of this data that we know about. We want to thank Dr. Kenneth Stevenson for coming, and we hope you all enjoyed the evening. Thank you.